All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, a very famous chapter dealing with that all of our work will be tried by fire. One day when we stand before God, everything that we do in this body will be judged. But I want to, let's start at the beginning here. Look at verse number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 4. The Bible reads, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? He's asking this question, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? He's saying we all have ministers that we've been saved by. Everyone has to be saved by a man. And, you know, but this, this question here, who is Apollos? That's the title of my sermon tonight is, Who is Apollos? Turn to Acts chapter 18. We're going to look at who this man was. Why is he significant? And why was there division over Paul versus Apollos within the church? Why were there questions being raised about, well, Apollos this or Paul that? How did it get to this point? What was the origins of the relationship between Paul and Apollos in the church? And why was it affecting the Corinthians so much? Listen, I'm going to tell you right from the beginning. Carnal Christians follow men and not God. And that's really what's, what, what is being dealt with here. That the Corinthian church was very carnal. He says, are ye not carnal? Right away, he's saying, you're in the flesh. You're being very fleshly when you're saying, oh, but Paul is this. Oh, well, Paul that. He's, you know, they're, they're creating divisions that are not necessary. And the Corinthians were divided in leadership between Paul and Apollos. And I'm going to warn you, this is, this is human nature. When he says, ye are yet carnal, you know, he, he actually said to them also, you are, walk as men. You're walking in the flesh, is what he's saying. You're being fleshly. He calls them babes in Christ. He's saying you're being a bunch of babies. Paul's writing to the church and he's saying you're acting like little children because you're more worried about what Paul said versus Apollos when we need to be following the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and that's the essence of the message tonight. And we have to be aware of our own human nature because our own human nature is to follow the alpha male. That is just nature. And God wants us to be leaders in our own right spiritually speaking. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul says, Follow me as I follow Christ. He's, he's saying, Paul is saying, I am following Christ. Follow me in that. In other words, you need to follow Christ. And it's okay to follow me as long as I'm following Christ, but never be so sold out for one man that you would follow him in the wrong direction and not follow Christ. In that same chapter, he says, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Who is the head of me? Christ. Who is the head of you? Christ. Who do I follow? Christ. Who should you follow? Christ. Not another man. And listen, yes, we have structured leadership all around us. God has put order in effect in every aspect of your life. And a lot of times we end up following other men. But spiritually speaking, and in the church, we follow a man that's following Christ and nothing else. We're not just following the man because we favor him. We're following Christ, and sometimes God uses men to point us in the right direction. So who is Apollos is the question tonight. You're in Acts chapter 18. We're going to look at the origins of this here. Look at verse number 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. And then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centura, for he had a vow. So here he's gone, he's got this couple with him, and, and it's saying that he has a vow. Now I believe this is a Nazarite vow in uh, Numbers chapter 6, it outlines what a Nazarite should do. The vow of a Nazarite in not touching wine or strong drink or liquor or vinegar or moist grapes or dried, it talks about. And there's certain things with the shaving of the head and then they're going to go and do a sacrifice. And it sounds like that's what Paul is keeping here. It doesn't 100% tell us that, but I believe that's what it is. That's what it seems to indicate. And look at verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. So he leaves Priscilla and Aquila. It says, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. 
and when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, verse 21, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed to Ephesus. So we see here, so Paul ends up leaving Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. He says, I got this vow. I got to do this thing. I've sworn I'm going to do. I'm trying to do something. If God wills it, I will be back. And we'll see he does come back. He ends up making it back. But he leaves Priscilla and Aquila behind. Skip down to verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria. All right, so here's Apollos. He enters the scene. He's born in Egypt. He's born in Alexandria, but he's a Jew, right? So he's under that old covenant. He's in the Old Testament. Look what it says. An eloquent man, that means well-spoken, and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. Now notice in the Bible, when it indicates that somebody is a Jew, that's usually contrasted by somebody that's a disciple. You will never see that a disciple is, is a Jew, there were Jews that became disciples, or what we would call Christians. They were once Jews under the Old Covenant. Today they must become Christian. Right? Romans 2, who is a Jew? But one that is circumcised in the heart. So you could say that, yes, hey, we're Jews. We are the Israel of God. We are God's chosen people. Now that we're disciples, now that we're Christians. So he knew the Scriptures, but he, there's something missing here. Look at this. Look at the next verse. Verse 25, it says, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. So it says he's mighty in the Scriptures. He's instructed in the way of the Lord. So this guy was mighty in the Word of God. He had knowledge and understanding about the Old Testament Scriptures, and he's going around teaching people about God. It says, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently, the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So this guy, he's an Old Testament Jew. He's still under that Old Covenant. He hears what John the Baptist taught. He knows the baptism of John, and I believe he was preaching the same thing as John. Look ahead to Acts chapter 19, verse 4. We'll see exactly what that is. It says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So Apollos believed what John preached. He probably preached the same thing, that Christ was coming. John said, believe on the one that's coming after me. Apollos believed that. He was mighty in the Scriptures. He's instructing in the way of the Lord. He's fervent in the Spirit. But there's something still missing there. He didn't know about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was bold in the Holy Spirit. He was trusting in Christ to come, but he was unaware of Christ fulfilling prophecy. So look what happens here. Verse 25. I'm sorry, actually... We're, uh, let's take a step back. Let's see. Yeah, verse 25. Let me just read that again. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Right? So, understanding who Apollos was, where he's coming from. I believe he was saved under the Old Covenant. I believe he was looking for Christ to come. He was preaching deliverance and everything that, that John taught. And it reminds me of the man Simeon. For those that remember, I preached a sermon about Simeon a couple months ago. The prophecies that Simeon had for the nation of Israel. In Luke 2 it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So this Simeon was the same way. The Holy Spirit was working through him. He was preaching. He was saved. He was looking forward to the Christ. Are you a dispensationalist? No, I believe there's two covenants, old and new. Well, what's the difference? The Holy Spirit. Well, when did we get the Holy Spirit? John chapter 21, when Jesus breathed on them after His resurrection, after He ascended to heaven and put the blood on the mercy seat, and He came back down the same day that He rose from the grave, He breathed on the disciples and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So that's when they began to have the Holy Spirit 
indwelling, that permanence. Now, Simeon did not see that. So the Holy Spirit on him was what fell upon him, just as with Saul, as with David, with other men of God. The Holy Spirit, God was working on them because they were mighty in the Scriptures, fervent in the Spirit. You know, they, they knew the way of the Lord and they were teaching people. So both of these were Old Testament saints saved by faith alone. You know, and there were some Jews that probably died in the time of Jesus that were saved just as Old Covenant saints and they never had the Holy Spirit, but they were saved by faith alone. They're in heaven now. We'll meet them today. Yep. Others, I believe, stopped being Jews. They ceased from that Old Covenant and they became Christians. They became disciples because they received the Holy Spirit understanding that Christ had come. And that's what we're going to see here with Apollos. Look at verse 26, Acts 18, verse number 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. So again, I believe he was preaching the same thing John the Baptist preached. And can you imagine Priscilla and Aquila? They're working with Paul. They're going to different locations. They're preaching Christ has already come. The Messiah, has, has he's here. He's resurrected. Salvation is in the name of Jesus Christ alone. And they meet this guy in the temple saying, Christ will come. Trust that Christ will come and you can be saved. And they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, we need to get together. Let me tell you something a little more perfect. They probably felt the fervency in the Spirit and the power of God on this man. And they said, wait a minute, you're missing some knowledge. You're missing some information. Yep. So it says they, they expounded the way of God more perfectly. What did John the Baptist say? John the Baptist thought, prepare a way, right? Prepare a people, make ready a people. And that's what Apollos was doing. And then Priscilla and Aquila teach him, hey, Christ has come. Yep. He is he has died. He's rose again. And I believe when he heard that, he understood it was the voice of the shepherd. Yeah. He understood, yes, this is right. This is of God. And, and, and his spirit resonated one with another. Look at verse 27. And when he was disposed to pass into Achai, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. So Apollos goes to people that were saved, if you will, under the New Testament before him, and he starts helping them. Why? Because he was already mighty in the Scriptures. He already knew the way of the Lord. He was already fervent in the Spirit. He was already a man of God. And so once he had that missing puzzle piece, God used him more and more, more mightily. So now he's actually going behind Paul. Notice Paul was in Ephesus. He leaves. Apollos shows up. Right? So it's like, they're playing musical chairs. God is sending another man to come in and confirm the things that the disciples already had. It says He's helping them. And He's helping them in the Scriptures. Look at verse 28. For He mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. He went from Jew to disciple. Now, it said he was a Jew. Now he's saying he's convincing the Jews. He's saying, hey, you need to be a Christian. He was looking for Christ, and he said, hey, I have found Christ. It is Jesus, and you need to understand that. So he being a teacher, God used this man mightily. Apollos was a teacher, both Old and New Covenants, if you will, throughout his life. It's an interesting character, and we don't have a lot from him, other than that the Corinthians, for some reason, had some contention over this man. And, you know, I think it's clear that God used him in a mighty way in the Old Testament. Look at the first verse of the next chapter, verse number 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So Paul's right here. Paul's in Ephesus. He leaves. Apollos shows up in Ephesus. And then Apollos goes to Corinth. And now Paul's back. Well, it's kind of, they're, they're playing... Musical chairs. They're making a circuit. They're not even necessarily aware of each other yet, but they're going to some of the same disciples and some of the same people. So here we see the beginning of Apollos going to Corinth, which is where we, st we started in chapter 3, where there's this division. Well, I'm of Apollos. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I'm of Paul. It's important to understand that both Paul and Apollos were of Christ. That's right. Yeah. And that they wanted to point everybody to Christ in the right direction. Look at Acts chapter 18, verse number 1. Acts chapter 18, 
verse number 1. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So Acts chapter 18, Paul's in Corinth. The end of the chapter, Paul's in Ephesus. Then Apollos is in Ephesus, and then Apollos goes to Corinth. So you see what's happening. There's people moving around. God's using different people at different times in the same locations to these disciples. And it begins to cause division and confusion among the weaker brethren. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So both Paul and Apollos were former leaders and teachers of the Jews, and now they've been converted. They're they're crossing each other's paths, going to certain cities where there are Christians. And especially in Corinth, that's where we see this issue come up. So they're meeting other disciples, and some disciples have good doctrine, some are new to the faith, some are babes. And, you know, we've used this example before, if somebody came and and they met somebody that, that I got saved or that you got saved and they were bad in doctrine... They say, oh, I I know Brother Jake. Well, you know Brother Jake. Well, surely Brother Jake teaches it this way. You understand, not everybody's at the same way. Not everybody's been discipled. Not everybody else has understanding of the Scriptures. And so what began to happen was there was a division of people that were more immature in the faith that had certain questions or they were looking to a man more than to God. And so that's where these divisions begin to happen. And again, problems arise in the flesh when you're looking more to a man than you are the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I've heard it said, and I don't know if it's true, that the the middle verse in the Bible is Psalm 118.8 where it says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Remember that. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Years ago I was at a church and the pastor ended up leaving and he caused a split and all sorts of other stuff. And there were a lot of people that just simply fell away because that was their hero. He was their guy. Well, if that's all you've got, if you don't have the scriptures for yourself, if you don't know what the Lord teaches for yourself, then you're going to be very weak. You're very childish as a Christian. And that's what we see you know, in these scriptures. As you're in 1 Corinthians 1, we need to remember that as a Christian and as a soul winner, each and every one of you are a teacher. Right? You yourself are a man. And when you knock on somebody's door, if they're looking for God, they're going to search for God at your face. Yeah. They're, they want to find God. They want to know the truth about eternity. And there you are with a Bible in your hand. They can't see God's face, but they see your face. Now look, yeah, it's very humbling. We need to admit that, hey, I'm not God. I am not perfect. I'm here to tell you a more perfect way. And we need to remind them, our responsibility as a Christian, being a leader and just a man, is that, hey, the Bible is right. We can trust the Word of God. You need to get that down. It's always right. We are not right. Look, if you're a Christian, you need to be willing to admit when you're in error. If if you're never wrong, then there's a problem. If you never have to say to your wife, I was wrong, I'm sorry, then man, you you might want to check yourself. If you're the guy at work, that always, it's always someone else's fault, and you know you did it. Listen, maybe you need to check yourself. Maybe you need to humble yourself because, you know, we shouldn't be self confident as a Christian. We need to be Christ confident. We need to be, you know, confident in the Bible, in the Scripture, and that's having the fruit of the Spirit. That's being filled with God's Spirit by admitting when we're wrong. And listen, that's what we need to teach because people have gotten it all wrong. Well, I know a pastor years ago and I got burned and I saw this situation happen. Yeah, I'm sorry that happened, but that's the flesh. That's people. Men will let you down. Don't put confidence in man. Put confidence in God and His Word. So what happens in Corinthians over Apollos and Paul? There's contention and division because of fleshly, selfish individuals. It's not everybody in the church. It's just certain individuals that never grew enough on their own to stand on their own. Look at verse number 10. 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What's he saying? These Corinthians, they need to stand together locally, together, but mature independently. It's your responsibility as an individual to mature, to begin to grow up. 
Look, we all pretty much feed ourselves. If you don't, you ought to. Right? There's some babies. They can't feed themselves. We have to help them. And that's what's happening here. Paul's trying to help these babies and say, quit being a baby and grow up a little. Look at verse 11. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. He's saying, well, you got these Paulites over here, and they're going against the Ap Apollosites, and then there's the Peterites. Well, I'm no, no, no. Well, Peter's my guy because Peter said this, and oh yeah, but 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 Pastor Paul, now he does it a different way, and that's my guy. Hey, Christ, be of Christ. We are Christians. That's who we follow. That's what Peter taught. That's what Apollos taught. That's what Paul taught. And if you miss that. Then you're looking at the flesh. Yeah. You never made it past the eyes of the man you're looking at. You need to look at the Word of God. This is where people get it wrong. This is why he calls them babes. Look at verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul is saying, stop following me. Follow Christ. From afar, Paul is saying, I'm not even there and I'm warning you. Get this right. Stop just following me. Follow God. Because yeah. they're more worried about, well, Paul's this, Apollos, Peter that. He says, follow Christ on your own. Look at verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in mine own name. He's saying, you guys are acting so silly that I'm ashamed of you. I'm embarrassed of what's going on. I'm glad I didn't baptize you. Otherwise, you'd be saying, well, I was baptized to Paul. They'd be going around bragging like a badge of honor, like, like a Girl Scout badge. Well, I got baptized to Paul. Who baptized you? Yeah. It's not about who did it. It's about did you do it? It was a command. Go to chapter 3. It's good preaching. He's saying, if you're a Paulite, you need to uh, disband from that group and you need to man up and be a Christian on your own. You need to become a Christian first and foremost and not an ite of anything. Yeah. Like these Ruckmanites. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm a real Ruckman boy. Oh, forget about that. Yeah. Forget about If Ruckman had any sense, if he were saved, he would have shut that down while he was alive. He would have said, stop. Don't call yourself after me. You are a Christian alone. Mm -hmm. Instead, they embrace the term. Mm -hmm. And it's not right. It just shows you the spirit of that group. Mm -hmm. You're in 1 Corinthians 3. Look at verse number 1. And I, brethren could not speak unto you as spiritual, as unto spiritual, but as the carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He's saying, you're unspiritual babies. You've got the wrong attitude. I wish I could talk to you spirit to spirit, but instead in my spirit, I'm, te I'm talking to you in the flesh. And I'm saying, stop your flesh from what it's doing. Keep your flesh from doing more damage. It's causing division. Look at verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. He said, you still haven't grown up. When I was there with you, I gave you the basics, and I expected you to grow up. Instead, here I am, giving you the basics again. Grow up. Follow Christ. Be a Christian. Start feeding yourself. Read your Bible for yourself. They were childish. Look at verse 3. For ye are yet carnal. You're saying you're, you're still fleshly. For whereas there is among you envying, right? Envying is coveting something that's not yours. Desiring something you shouldn't even have. It. He says, and strife, there's fights among you. He says, and divisions, there's separations among you. Are ye not carnal and walk as men? You're not walking in the Spirit when a man of God's telling you you're walking as a man. Can you imagine a 15-year-old? baby can you imagine a 15 year old bellying up to the table mama feed me i'm hungry come get me some food bring, bring me a spoon over here put it to my mouth mom bring me the water mom, i want some milk bring me the milk over here. give it to me put it down my throat could you imagine a 15 year old baby it would be ridiculous yep. we would laugh at it we would say there's something wrong with the growth of this individual and here Paul is saying, I was with you. You were a baby. We were feeding you. You were supposed to begin to grow on your own and get to the meat. Instead, here you are acting like a child again, saying, well, I'm of this group. I'm of that camp. I'm of that guy. 
How about be of Christ? Yeah. And you wouldn't have these problems. Yeah. Look at verse 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Look, we are born again, Bible-believing Christians. We are not Paulites. We are not Apollosites. Even today, we should not call ourselves a Paulite. I am of Paul. I've just, and it's funny, I've met dispensational. We only believe what Paul preached. Well, hey, Paul said not to do that. Yeah. Paul said, take all the scriptures, become mighty in the scriptures, trust the Lord. Old and New Testament, understand what he has for you. And those that refuse to grow, well, I'm just a Paul. All, everything Paul said is mine and nothing else. Well, then you're missing out. Because Paul himself is telling you to not do that. Look at verse 5. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but ministers, that's servants. Paul saying, I am a servant by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. We all got saved by someone, but Christ is the Savior that we follow, not the soul winner. Look, everybody in here is a soul winner. Could you imagine if there was 30 people from last year that took your name? Brother Dale, imagine if there were 30 people that said, I'm a Daleite. <laughs> I am a Daleite, and I follow Dale, and what Dale says is what I believe, and every, everything he says I believe, and if he didn't say it, I won't believe it. Dale should rebuke them and say, no, follow Christ. Yeah. Follow the Bible. Trust in the Lord. And that's what was beginning to happen here. Look at verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God gave the growth. Hey, maybe Paul got them saved. Maybe Apollos discipled them, but it's Christ that we call ourselves after. It's God Himself that helps that seed in your heart to begin to grow. Verse 7, So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. He's saying God is everything. And notice, Paul is one of the problems here. Paul and Apollos are both problems in the eyes of the Corinthians. And Paul is saying, I am nothing. Follow Christ. You understand? He's saying, as part of the problem, he's not saying, well, everybody knows I'm better than Apollos. I mean, I did write 14 books. No, what he say? I am nothing. I am nothing, but God is everything. Look at verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. This whole chapter is about our work and our reward. We need to stand as Christians, as individuals. We need to work for Christ. Have you ever heard of the followers of Paul Baptist Church? No, it doesn't exist. How about just Christian? We're called Christians. And here they needed to become adults. There were many of the Corinthians that were wrong. They needed better discipleship. They needed to learn to trust the Scriptures. They needed to learn to stand as an adult on their own. Look at verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. But he's saying God wants to use you. Stop worrying about Paul and Apollos. He, a husbandry, he's talking about like a vine, like pulling grapes off of a vine. God, he said, God's saying you're the precious fruit of the earth. God is saying, you're the building, you're the temple, you people together need to work together. And Paul says, Paulos and I, we're one. We're the same. We're nothing. It's God that matters. It's Christ. Amen. Jump ahead to verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. You understand what he says? Let no man glory in men. If somebody, well, you know, I was talking with Pastor Fancy Pants, and he said, oh, Pastor Roughneck over there, that he was wrong on how they do communion. He was wrong on eating meat. Don't glory in them. Glory in the Word of God. Yeah. That Your answer to that should be, well, do you know what the Bible says? Because that's what I stand on. It's not what Pastor Fancy Pants says. It's not what Pastor Roughneck says. It's what the Word of God says. That's where we stand. That's how we grow. He says, all things are yours. He gave us all power in His name. In the Great Commission, He has all power. And he says, therefore, go. And he says, now all things are yours. All things have been given to us to understand all mysteries. We need to read our own Bible. We need to study our own doctrine. We need to stop following people and follow God. <laughs> Grow up. 
get out of boot camp and go to war on your own merit for God. That's where too many people miss it. Well, I, went, I moved to a good church so I can be in boot camp and I can learn to fight and I can learn to use my sword and I can learn to be a soul winner. Hey, praise the Lord for it. I'm glad you're, you went to boot camp. But how long do you normally stay in boot camp? Eight Two years? Weeks. Eight years? Eight weeks. Eight weeks. You stay in boot camp for eight weeks. Learn to be a soul winner. Learn to trust your own weapon, the Word of God. Right. And get out there and use it. Don't just stop, oh, I'm in boot camp Baptist church. We're just here forever. We're just learning the same thing all over again. Well, there's something wrong there with that. Yeah. Well, I don't fight. I, I, we let the pastor do all the fighting. We just sit back and watch the show. Well, that ain't right either. Nope. We need to be in the fight for ourselves. We all have our own ministry. Look at verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. God's given us everything. And it comes down to individual Christian responsibility. What do you want to do with it? Because you think about Apollos. Apollos could have just said, oh, wait, there's a man of God that I can learn from. I'll just go follow Paul. No, Apollos was already following God. And he said, hey, now I'll go and work for God. He didn't just stop and become a Paulite. He said, no, I've got a ministry. God's already given me a ministry. I'm going to keep on doing what I've been told to do. And we need to have that same attitude. Not just of looking for some next great man to follow but looking for the Lord Jesus Christ in our personal life, our individual Christian responsibility of moving forward on our own, of growing as an individual. Verse 23, he says, And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. He wants you to be able to fight without Paul, without Apollos, be able to stand on your own. Look at chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 5. He says, therefore, judge nothing before the time. And this probably sounds familiar to Proverbs where it says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and shame unto him. If you judge something before the time, that's gossip. If you start making judgment calls without facts, you're going to say something that's foolish. You're probably going to sin with your lips. Look at it again, verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart and then shall every man have praise of God. He said, don't worry, God will take care of things in His time. Look at verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Right? He's saying, he is putting, again, he's putting him and Apollos in the same category. It's not Apollos versus Paul. Paul's trying to end that right there. He's saying, no, Corinthians, quit pitting us against each other. We're both fighting for Christ. We're not fighting against each other. And that's where the Christian churches have failed over the years. They, they point their guns inward. They attack each other. They look for the problem in their brother's life instead of fixing their own problems. They're always looking for a battle in the church instead of going with their brother and growing together and going out into the battle. And he says that no one should be puffed up for one against another. Well, yeah, we, come on, Brother Dale, you and me, we're for old Pastor Roughneck. Old Pastor Roughneck, he's going to show up, Pastor Fancy Pants. Don't get puffed up about other people. Again, we need to humble ourselves and focus on our own ministry. We have to answer for ourselves. Well, Paul's a better preacher. Yeah, but Apollos, now he's, he's a better teacher, so, so I'm a Paulite. Paul would say, no, we are one. Amen. We are both doing the work of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ is who you follow, the Word of God. Yep. Verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? This verse, this verse makes me think of post-trib pride. And you guys probably know what I'm talking about. There have been certain preachers that come up with certain revelations, and then everyone else comes to you as if they had discovered it themselves. All puffed up. Well, guess what I figured out? Well, yeah, I heard that too. Okay, <laughs> didn't come from you. In the same way, people go into pre-trib churches with post-trib pride. 
like they are the ones with the keys to the universe. They have discovered all the secrets and they know it all. And they're there to go, go to a man of God, a man that's been a pastor for 30 years, that's been faithful and winning souls and raising children and teaching disciples and they want to go to him with Matthew 24 like, like you're nothing because I know Matthew 24. Yeah. A little post-trib pride. Getting all puffed up. Well, I got this thing that I know. Yeah, where'd you get that from? We received it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, where do we get our knowledge from about God? Either from a preacher that we heard it from or from our own Bible study. Neither one originated with you. And anything you find, it's okay to get excited and zealous, but don't get so puffed up and proud. Yeah, I'm the one, man. I got that figured out. No, you didn't. God gave that to you. Humble yourself. How did God give it to you? Probably with humility and some wisdom, some understanding, and that's how we need to give it to others. Next, Paul gets a little sarcastic with them to these puffed up individuals. Look at verse 8. He says, Now ye are full. Now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. He's, you think you're better than everyone else? You, oh, you're rich. You're reigning. You got it all figured out. You know everything. You've got it all understood and learned. Paul answers them with humility. He shows his sarcasm and he answers them by contrasting with his own humility, not boasting of his authority. Understand, Paul has authority from God to set things in order in the church. But he didn't come in with a rod. He's writing them in, in a humble mind, in a humble heart, trying to restore them, not showing his power, but showing his meekness. Look at verse 9. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. Oh, but ye are wise, right? Paul knows a ton of Scripture. Understand this. Paul studied on one of the best scholars of the time. He went to the best college. He had more Bible knowledge. God used him to write 14 books in the Bible. He could have said, I am this, I am that. Instead, he says, I'm a fool. I am nothing. Woe unto me. Oh, but you guys got it all figured out. You got a little bit of knowledge and you're so puffed up over it, you want to argue, well, I got this knowledge from Apollo, so I like Apollos more than Paul. Or vice versa. Paul's trying to shut that down. He says, you are wise in Christ, we are weak. Ye are strong, ye are honorable, but we are despised. We are despised. Listen, sometimes as men, we have to understand that there are other men we look to for leadership that make mistakes. There are other men we look to for leadership that aren't giving us the right information because it doesn't come from the Word of God. Yep. Last year I was in Fort Worth soul winning with a friend I haven't gone soul winning with in a long time. And he was telling me of his technique and his method, and I, I, I am very, I, you know, I try to be very concise at the door. I time my gospel presentation. I've got it down to 17 minutes. I try to keep it all in this short little window so I can put it in a box, and I have an Excel spreadsheet. And I, whoa, whoa, whoa! Why? Be thorough. Be sincere. Make sure it's a two-way street. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. Make sure they know what's going on. Well, but Garrett Kirchway said that his presentation takes him, you know, 15, 16, 17 minutes. So I'm trying to look at that and I'm trying to analyze this and I got all my data and I have all my data points and I'm spreading it out and I want to know what's going on. Now, later we found out Garrett Kirchway was a false prophet yeah. <laughs> preaching a false gospel of a false God. And, then, and I'm thinking, and I thought of that guy when all that hit the fan. I thought, man, this guy has modeled his gospel presentation off of a man that's not even saved that's just checking boxes, saying, I just. Check that box. It took 17 and a half minutes. Oh, I, was, I took extra half a minute. I can't believe I wasted that time. Listen, preaching the gospel is a one-on-one -on -one thing. It takes time. You need to be thorough. You need to make sure they're understanding you. And if somebody criticizes you because you take 30 minutes or 40 minutes, say, hey, praise the Lord, because I know I'm doing it right. Okay. I am making sure they understand this, yep. that they can chew on it, that they're actually getting saved. Well, I, 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 you're not fast enough. We are fast at our soul winning. We are more efficient than you. Hey, I check and I double check. 
and I make sure they're actually going to heaven. I don't care. I'm not coming back with a number. I'm coming back with a soul confirmed. That's the goal of soul. Treat them like your mother. Yeah, treat them like your mother. Be patient. Be long suffering. Be compassionate. Have enough love to slow down and be a real person. We're almost done here. Look at verse number eleven. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. He's saying, ye are comfortable. Oh, you're comfortable in your house. You got it all figured out. I don't even know if I'm going to have a house next month. Paul's making this point. Why? He has no certain dwelling place. He is going from place to place to place trying to help people. And some of the people he's trying to help are so immature, they're trying to pit him against another man of God to pick a fight. And Paul's trying to shut it down. Look at verse 12. And labor, talking about him, Paul saying that we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Does that sound like the sermon this morning? Yeah. That's what Christ did. Amen. That's what Paul did. That's what he's trying to teach them. Instead, it's like, well, we got reviled, so we're going to attack their man, their method. Back up. Humble yourself. Love your brother. Be willing to grow together. Look at... Well, you know, I mentioned this earlier. It says, he says, be ye followers of me as I am followers of Christ. That's the whole goal. I would stop following Paul the moment he fell off the edge and quit following Christ. And that's what Christianity ought to be. Unfortunately, it has become a, a cult of personality in a lot of churches. Yeah. Pastor Wesley was telling me about another pastor that a much bigger church and he falls into adultery and the church just deals with it and covers it up a little bit and they want to restore this and that. And he says, I won't have him come preach for me. I try to be his friend and try to help consult him and he's asked me to go preach for him, but he's not coming to preach behind my pulpit. You do something worthy of getting kicked out of church as a man of God, you need to stop being a man of God and get back to being a Christian. Right. If you're failing at being a Christian, then guess what? You're failing at being a pastor. Yeah. The, the basics of Christianity need to be the focus. Again, he said, I, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Who's in charge of you? Jesus Christ. You are not a Paulite. You are not an Apollosite. You are not a Peterite or a Cephasite. You are a Christian. That's what identifies you. Look at verse 13. Of Paul here again, he's still speaking. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Again, Paul later, at the, by, this is in the beginning of Corinthians, by the end of the second book of Corinthians, he's saying that he is accused of being a reprobate. By the other, other people are saying, oh, well, you know Paul, he's a reprobate. He's saying, okay, whatever, even if I am, make sure you're not a reprobate. You make sure you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that's what you stand on, not on Paul. He tried to make that clear. Go to 1 Corinthians, actually, look at verse 14 before we go there. Verse 14, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. There's the warning. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. There's the warning. Don't just follow men. If you're just following men, if your confidence is in a man, you will be let down. I guarantee you every time, if you're just having confidence in man, you will be let down. I see all the women nodding their heads. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Guess what, ladies? Your husband will let you down. Right. But if your confidence is in Christ, and your confidence is that if you obey God, He will work things out in your family, when your husband falls, when he messes up, you're, it's easier to forgive him. It's, it's easier to love him. It's easier to make sure you do the right thing to be there to pick him back up instead of tearing him down. Again, we need to take heed to our own doctrine. We need to do our own work. We need to stop following men. We need to read for ourselves. We need to pray for ourselves. We need to study the Bible individually for ourselves. And then you won't be deceived by a man. You're in 1 Corinthians 16. We're going to end with this here. Look at verse number 10. Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. He's saying Timotheus is coming to help you. We've already had divisions in your church from this man to that man. Make sure when he gets there, you let him help you. He shouldn't have to come in in fear. Are they going to receive me? Are they going to pit me against Paul if I go to help these? Are they going to compare me to Apollos or to Peter? Are you saying, receive him. He's coming to help you. Look at verse 11. 
He says, let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace that he may come unto me. For I look for him with the brethren. Again, he's saying, help. he's coming to help you. Help him. Help him. Verse 12. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. Now first he says, as touching our brother Apollos. Well, Paul and Apollos, there's contention there, but he still calls him a brother? Why didn't Paul just call him a reprobate and get it over with? Then they, then they, he would have won that argument. No, he, hey, Paul, Apollos is my brother. I wanted him to come help you, but his will was something different. How's he say it? Look at it again. His will was not at all to come at this time. Apollos is going against Paul's will, and yet he's in God's will. You understand? Not, it, oh, this guy over here, he's a man of God. His will reigns. His will is the will of God. No, maybe he is in God's will for his life, but that doesn't mean he tells you what God's will is for your life. Right. If God's will for your life contradicts with what another man of God, it's okay. Yeah. You don't answer to just another man of God. You answer to God. Yeah. God wants you to be your own man of God. Apollos didn't have to get orders from Paul to know what the will of God was. Apollos knew the will of God. He was mighty in the Scriptures. He didn't have to call in and, hey, I need to talk to Peter to make sure I'm doing the right thing because I think I should be doing, hey, just do what you know. He didn't have to confirm these things with Peter or Paul. Again, individual Christian responsibility. Individual Christian responsibility. God wants you to grow. Look at verse 13. How do you grow? Watch ye and stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Now listen, he's saying, stand on your own two feet. Right? Stop the sin. Be acquit, acquit that, right? Get your own ministry. Make sure you're standing on your own. Make sure you're not dependent on somebody else to be able to serve God. My dad used to say whenever we get in trouble, he said, if the first word out of your mouth is somebody else's name, then you're in trouble. In other words, well, why did you do that? Well, my brother, well, my sister, well, the kid down the block, uh, wrong answer. Why did you do what you did? When you stand before God and God says, why didn't you read the Bible more? Well, my wife, God's going to say, unacceptable answer. Why did you not read the Bible more? Why did you not get the sin out of your life? You can't use somebody else's name. It's, it, it comes down to you. Individual Christian responsibility. Amen. He said, watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. How do we be strong Christian men? Read the next verse. Verse 14. Let all your things be done with charity. Paul loved Apollos enough even though he was being compared to him, even though he was, oh, he's better, he's or worse, or Paul loved him enough as a brother, even though his will went against Paul's will, Paul loved him enough as a brother to allow that and not just throw him under the bus and not defame him as he was being defamed by others. We need to be a man of God and to not be fleshly means we need to do it with charity. How do you be strong and be a man? Have some charity. Amen. That's Amen. harder to do. The young man we got saved this afternoon, he, he said it best. He said, oh, doing the wrong thing is easy. It is not, it is not easy to do the right thing. And I'm like, boy, that'll preach. I mean, this, this kid knew it. He knew he was lost. And what he said was so true. Look at verse 15. I beseech you, brethren. You know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Are you addicted to brotherly love? Are you addicted to ministering to other Christians, to other disciples, to preaching the gospel? Or are you on a witch hunt for any reason to say, oh, well, Stephanus, oh, well, Apollos. No. He's saying, hey, these are brothers too. Oh, well, Timotheus. Oh, did you hear what Timotheus? Forget about that. Look at yourself. Have charity. 
help those that are trying to help you. We're not always just looking for some reason why everybody's not as good as Paul. Paul was not as good as Christ, and yet Paul was probably better than every one of us in this room. If that's how we want to compare ourselves, we're not wise. You need to compare yourself by looking into the mirror. The perfect law of liberty. So who was Apollos? He was a servant of the Lord. He was mighty in the Scriptures. He was fervent in the Spirit. But yet he was just a soul winner like you and I are. And he had charity. Let's be like Apollos. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this fascinating story, this comparison between Paul and Apollos. Lord, thank you for the humble attitude of Paul that rather than try to destroy Apollos, he embraced him. He encouraged him in the ministry. Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand, to be men, to be strong in the faith. We have to have charity and brotherly love. Lord, I pray you continue to bless this church with more souls saved and more people baptized and more disciples made here in Jacksonville. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.